from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I would like to introduce to you Mr. Kirk Rasko, the Director of the Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance here at the library, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Peg Clifton, for, this, uh, for the honor of having to appear here today. The Library of Congress is unique in the federal service. It is the largest library in the world, the research arm of Congress, an exhibition center, an international tourist destination, a, a national cultural center, and more. As such, the diversity of American society should be represented at the library in all of its programs and activities. The American people, members of Congress, donors to the library, scholars and dignitaries, guests and visitors all expect to experience the diversity of the nation when they seek to access the services and programs of the library. The Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness and Compliance assists the library fulfill its obligation by exploring new avenues in which to broaden the scope of services and programs and to more fully reflect the American experience in all of its aspects. In keeping with that mission, we are responsible for assisting with implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The American with Disabilities Act, American with Disabilities Amendment Act, ADAA, is the ADA and ADAA, and Library of Congress Regulation 2025-8. Our advice covers the full spectrum of obvious and hidden disabilities in the following categories. Deaf, hard of hearing, blind, blind deaf, low vision, dexterity, mobility, medical and cognitive disabilities. We also collaborate with the Assistive Technology Demonstration Center a facility dedicated to the evaluation and assessment of assistive technology, some of which you will learn about today from today's speaker, Dr. Michael Korist. Dr. Korist is a technology theorist with an unusual perspective. His body is the future. In 2001, he went completely deaf and had a computer implanted in his head to let him hear again. This transformative experience inspired his first book entitled Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human. <clears throat> Guess it's like Frankenstein in reverse. Um, he wrote about how mastering his new ear, a cochlear implant, enabled him to enhance his creative potential as a human being. In 2006, Rebuilt won the Penn USA Book Award for Creative Nonfiction. Born in New Jersey, Dr. Korst earned his BA at Brown University where he studied computer programming, Renaissance drama, and cultural theory on the way to his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. After graduate school, he worked briefly at a dot-com in San Francisco and then spent four and a half years doing research and education at SRI International in Menlo Park, California. His second book, entitled Worldwide Mind, The Coming Integration of Humanity, Machines, and the Inter Internet, proposes that humanity can incorporate the computer into its collective soul in a way that enhances communities and creative work instead of diminishing them. As a freelance science writer, he has written for Wired, The Washington Post, Technology Review, and The Scientist, among others. 
He wrote the screenplay for a television special on brain implants entitled The 22nd Century, which aired on PBS in January of 2007. He sits on external advisory boards for neuroscience research at Northwestern and Brown. He now resides in Washington, D.C. with his wife and their two cats. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Korrest. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm very grateful to the Library of Congress for inviting me here today. So before I go on, let's do a sound check. I want to make sure everyone can understand me all right. Are you hearing me okay in back? Okay, very good. Okay, if you're not, please raise your hand and let me know. Because as a deaf person with cochlear implants, I have a volume control on my ears. So I'm never quite sure of how loud anything really is. So I always rely on help from my audience to let me know if I can be heard. So my talk today is called How to Put Your Brain on the Internet, Lessons from a Cyborg. So this is being webcast on YouTube. You can see directions. And also, I have a Twitter feed, um, at Mike Korst. And if you want to put out some tweets about it, I'd be grateful. So there's a hashtag. Chorus LOC. So my talk is going to start with a lesson from a cyborg grounded in my experience as a cochlear implant user. And then it's going to talk about how to put your brain on the internet and would you want to. So let's start about what brings me here? What brings me to this place in talking about these things? And the answer is that I went abruptly deaf in 2001 the story is that I was born with severe to profound hearing losses. I was not diagnosed until I was about three and a half. It was at that point that I got hearing aids and I began to learn English. So I wore hearing aids until I was 36 years old, at which point I abruptly lost all of the remaining hearing in my good ear, which was my left ear. So at that point, I was too deaf to get any benefit from hearing aids. Nobody knows why that happened, by the way. The reason I was born deaf was because my mother had rubella when she was pregnant with me. But why I went abruptly deaf in one day on July 7, 2001, is still unknown. Anyway, while the cause was unknown, the treatment was not. So I got a cochlear implant in October 2001, and at that point, I immediately started writing a book. Because I'm a writer by nature. I like to write about the things that I go through. So that experience resulted in the publication of my first book, Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human. And you can see the hardcover edition there. And that's my own skull on the cover. And you can see the implant in my skull. So I like to think that I'm the only author in publishing history with a picture of his head on the outside and the inside of the book jacket. <laughs> the book came out in paperback, and so there's the paperback, Rebuilt, My Journey Back to the Hearing World. Different subtitle, the book is exactly the same, except I fixed one typo. And then a few years later, I published Worldwide Mind, The Coming Integration of Humanity, Machines, and the Internet. I was always fascinated by technology and computers. I did a lot of programming. So when I ended up getting a computer inside my head, I just ran with that opportunity and started writing books about it. So let me walk you through Cochlear Implant 101 so that you understand the kind of technology that's in my head. So let's start by pretending that this is a normal year without all this interesting circuitry in it. In a normal ear, sound will come in through the ear canal, hit the eardrum, which makes these bones vibrate. That vibration is transmitted through the cochlea, which is a hollow tube filled with liquid and tiny cells that resonate in response to sound. As those hair cells resonate, they send sound signals down the hearing nerve 
to the brain. The reason that most people are deaf is that they lose those tiny hair cells inside the cochlea. It's like stripping the keys off of a piano. The strings are still there. The piano can still create sound. It's just that there's no keys to trigger those strings. Similarly, in my case, the auditory nerve is intact. It's just that there are no tiny hairs left inside my cochlea to vibrate in response to sound. That's why I'm deaf. So what a cochlear implant does is it replaces that mechanical system with an electronic system. So let me walk you through how that works. Let's start with the outside. So on the outside, you can see this thing called a headpiece. And that corresponds to this disc that you see here, specifically this thing. Now, that headpiece, as you can see, it actually sticks to my head. Okay, stupid implant tricks. <laughs> That's because there's a magnet in the headpiece that makes it stick to a magnet inside the implant itself. So that explains why the headpiece sticks there. But what is the headpiece? Well, the headpiece is taking a radio, or rather, it's taking an electronic signal from the thing on my ear, which is a string of ones and zeros. It's digitized sound. And it is sending that string of ones and zeros through my skin to the implant which is embedded in my skull underneath the skin. It's not inside my skull. It's not a brain implant. It's on top of the skull, countersunk into the surface of the skull. And I'll show you a wonderfully gory picture of that in a moment. Hmm? Sorry, did I hear somebody ask a question? Yes. Just thank you for the warning. OK. So the implant picks up the radio signal. And each job is to send that signal down this wire, which terminates in a string of electrodes inside the cochlea. In this close-up, you can see that string of electrodes curled up inside the cochlea. And here are the little electrode plates. Those are tiny electrodes made of platinum and iridium. And those electrodes are strobed on and off in complex patterns to activate the nerves inside the center of the cochlea. So this is the beginning of that. So as these things trigger on and off, sending little shocks, they force the nerves inside the center of the cochlea to send sound information down the auditory nerve to the brain. So that's what a cochlear implant does. It replaces the mechanical system of the inner ear with an electronic system that sends digital information into the auditory cortex of the brain. Amazing technology. So that's cochlear implant 101. Now let me show you a real cochlear implant. And this is a slide I love to show just at the lunch hour. <laughs> so you can see here, this is a cochlear implant. It's not my cochlear implant, by the way. It's somebody else's cochlear implant. It has just been installed in the surface of the skull. You can see that the skin is still retracted, so the surgeon has not yet closed it up. But you can see that the surgeon has countersunk it into the skull so that this surface is almost flush with the top of the skull. You can also see that he has tied it down with metal sutures so that it doesn't go anywhere. And if you look closely, you can also see that there's a little bit of brand information on the implant. It says Advanced Bionics, Clarion Platinum 2, model such and such, this side out. <laughs> I just love the fact that I have a part of my body labeled this side out. <laughs> if you think about it for a minute, the reason is obvious. If it was the wrong side out, the magnet would be facing the wrong way, and the headpiece would fly off of my head instead of sticking. So the two magnets have to stick to each other to make that radio signal go through. And you can see here the beginning of the electrode array, which is going down through a tunnel that the surgeon has drilled through the bone down to the inner ear. 
That drilling goes in about an inch and a half. The electrode array, if you take an x-ray of my skull, the electrode array is right behind the pupil of my iris. Okay. So if you look at my eye, you can see how deep that electrode array is going into my head. So it's quite a remarkable surgery. By the way, it goes very fast. My first implant was installed in about an hour and a half. The second one in about 41 minutes. I went in the morning, went home the afternoon, newly wired up. Now, if you could open up that, that casing and look inside, this is what you would see. You would see a bunch of chips, a bunch of resistors, and all sorts of little wires. So, when I first went deaf, I went to an audiologist, and she showed me one of these things. And I held it in my hand and stared at it. And I thought, oh my god, they're really going to put this thing inside me. What's that going to be like? How will this mass of silicon and resist resistors actually replace a part of my body? So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So very briefly, this is how the software works. So I showed you before that the electrode array is curled up inside the cochlea. It's got 16 electrodes. The electrodes that are all the way at the basal end here, when those electrodes flash on and off, they stimulate nerves. They're used to coding high frequency sounds. When the electrodes all the way at the tip of the array flash on and off, they stimulate nerves that are used to getting low frequency sounds. So the software breaks up sound by frequency. It takes all the high pitches and sends them down here. It takes all the low pitches and it sends them down there. So it takes sound apart, kind of the way a coin sorter will take coins and sort them by the size of the coin. And it will send the appropriate frequencies to the appropriate part of the cochlea. So you may wonder, how many people have this technology? Is it new? Is it experimental? The answer is no, it's not. It's been around since the 1990s. And there's about 219,000 people with implants worldwide since the technology became commercial in the very late 1980s. So you may wonder, is that a lot or a little? Well, to give you a little bit of perspective, in the United States alone, there are about 500,000 people who have hearing losses severe enough to make them candidates to get a cochlear implant. Half a million in this country alone. And yet, worldwide, there's less than a quarter of a million implant users. So what that tells you is that this technology is still very much underused, that there are many people who could benefit from this technology who don't have it. And there are many reasons for that, economic reasons, reasons of knowledge, reasons of what doctors believe, and so forth. So even though the technology has been around for decades, it is still very much an emerging technology. So now, let me give you an inkling of what the world sounds like to me with a cochlear implant. So I'm going to play you a couple of sound files. And let me tell you what this is about. You're going to hear what sounds like an English sentence that has been electronically filtered to resemble the output of a cochlear implant. And your challenge will be to figure out what the sentence is. I'm going to play you a couple of versions of that sentence. The first version, the four-channel version, roughly corresponds to what some of the very earliest users of experimental cochlear implants heard. Because at that time, they had only four or six electrodes. They were very primitive devices by today's standards. When my first cochlear implant was first turned on, the software gave me the equivalent of eight electrodes. I'm simplifying here. Because at that point, even though there were 16 electrodes in the electrode array, the software treated each pair of them as if it was a single electrode. So I got, in effect, eight electrodes worth of information. Then a year later, I got new software that made each electrode an individual channel, giving me 16 channels. So I'm going to play you 4, 8, and 16. 
Let's see if you can figure out what the sentence is. I'll play it again. Can anybody make that up? Yeah. No takers? I'd like to play tennis. Any other guesses? Shush. Shush. <laughs> well, if you listen to it, you can actually kind of hear that shush. Let me play that again. I have to find the pointer. It always gets lost on this slide. At the very end, you sort of hear that kind of sound, don't you? Okay. So, who thinks that I like to play chess? Okay, it could be that, right? All right, now E channels. And when you hear this, you'll hear a pretty good rendition of what things sounded like to me on that first day back in October 2001. I have to find the pointer. Okay, any guesses? Well, I'm seeing people nodding, okay? How many people feel sure that it's, I like to play tennis? Okay, a bunch of you. Now, about a year later, in 2002, I was upgraded to 16 channels. And that was not a surgical process. They just put new software in the processor. There's actually a little data port in which the audiologist can plug a port and they just transfer new software into the processor. So it's very easy to get upgraded. Here's 16 channels. As soon as I find it, there we go. I like to play tennis. <laughs> so you can hear the difference. You hear that the 16 channel version is smoother than the 8 channel version. But now let me play you the original unedited sound file. I like to play tennis. Big difference, right? So there are two lessons to be drawn from this slide. The first lesson is that a cochlear implant does not give you superhuman hearing. It is not Jamie Summers' bionic woman, X-Men kind of hearing. On the other hand, it is usable hearing. It allows me to use the telephone, listen to the radio, have conversations, even in noisy rooms and in restaurants. So that's the lesson to be drawn from that slide. Okay, so now we've done Cochlear Implant 101, Cyborg 101, or rather, Modern Day Cyborg 101. So let's we'll talk about what this technology means for the future. So let's talk about some emerging neuroprosthetic technologies. So this is a video, there's no sound in the video, it's just a video, that shows a double amputee. He lost both of his arms, he was an electrical linesman, he was electrocuted, both of his arms had to be amputated at the shoulder. So people are working on building externally wearable prosthetic arms for him to use. So these arms are getting their information from those electrodes that you can see on his back. They are picking up the twitches of his muscles and in fact, surgeons have actually moved around the nerves in his stump to different places on his back and his shoulder. So that when he imagines a given set of muscle motions, muscles will actually twitch in his back and on his chest. And the electrodes pick up those, twitchings, those twitches and they figure out what he's trying to do and they make the arm do it. So this is an example of what state of the art in prosthetic arms today. And you'll notice, by the way, he's wearing goggles. So they're clearly not entirely sure of the safety of these devices yet. <laughs> so let me tell you two things about this. On the one hand, it's incredibly impressive. He's actually controlling this thing fairly well. On the other hand, it still falls very far short of reproducing a natural arm. First of all, he gets no sensory feedback from the arm, so he only knows where it is by looking at it. Second, the software is only sophisticated enough to decode one motion at a time. So it's hard for him to just move smoothly and do several things at a time. 
It's more like he's got to move the elbow, move the wrist, move the elbow. He has to decompose the motion and, and execute them one at a time. So it is both impressive and underwhelming at the same time. So this shows you kind of the cutting edge of how much information we can get of what the brain wants from reading muscles on the outside of the body. There's nothing going on with the technology in his brain for this particular technology. So what if you could go to the brain? Now, this is something that I wrote about in a story I wrote for Wired magazine last year. It's called Waiting for the Bionic Man. So you can actually just find it online by doing a Google search for Wired, Bionic Arm, and my last name, Corist, C-H-O-R-O-S-T. And so I explored some of the things that prosthetic arms can do, but also why it is still so difficult to make them behave as well as naturally performing arms. Okay, people are trying to get into the brain itself to figure out how to read information out of the brain, because that's where the information is. It's like, this is why Willie Sutton robbed banks, because that's the, where the money is. This is why researchers are trying to get in the brain, because that's where the code is that tells you what the brain is trying to do. So this is a very primitive technology that I actually tried. Now, that's me wearing a cap with electrodes. And what this does is I'm looking at that computer screen, and various letters are flashing on and off. It's flashing one letter at a time. And I'm just looking at a letter and waiting for it to flash. When it flashes, there's a perceptible signal that goes on in my visual cortex, where the visual cortex is, is saying, hey, something just happened. When that happens, the computer knows that what I was looking at has just been lit up. And it puts that letter on the screen up on top here. So it's actually a very simple technology. It's just looking for activation in the visual cortex. And it works surprisingly well. I was able to spell out hello out there just by looking at different letters on this grid. So it's a really interesting technology, but it's still external to the body. Okay, what about, go what about going inside? Well, this is a new video. Well, not that new, it's about two years old now. This is of a woman who is paraplegic, completely paralyzed, and she had an implant installed in her brain in the motor cortex, the part that controls the arm. And that implant is being used to drive the robotic arm that you see here. So you can see on the top of her head, that is the plug that is actually picking up electrical signals from inside her motor cortex. That's being sent to the computer, and the computer is trying to figure out from her brain activity what she is trying to do with the robotic arm. And you can see that A, it does kind of work, and B, it's not ready for prime time. So again, we have that combination of amazing and underwhelming. And you'll see in a moment, she will get it up to her mouth, So I was told by John Donahue, who is the PI, the principal investigator of the study, that this was the first time since she had been paralyzed that she was able to pick up a cup and bring it to her own mouth by herself. Now she's got to get it back down on the table. Yeah. 
So it's really quite amazing um, what this technology can do. But we're still trying to grapple with the question of how much further can you go with this kind of technology? Well, I'll show you a short clip from a, from a TV show that I wrote back in 2007 asking, well, how do you get inside the brain? And here's one possible way. And this video does have audio. So if you can't hear it, raise your hand and I'll turn the volume up. A lot of excitement because for the first time uh, there was a way to access the brain without never touching it. And the brain being such a vital organ, uh, it's quite understandable you, you want to leave it alone. So the technology is there. Now the question would be, yes, but can you actually put I mean, nanowires exactly at the place you want? The answer is no, you can't. But nanowires are very small. So 500 nanometer, 500 nanometer is very small. If you think of it, that's about um, you know 100 times less uh, uh, than the thickness of your hair. How do you push the electrode to the brain? So what you do is you actually send a certain number of them. You have a bundle, and then the bundle uh, would, uh, would be the nanowire would be allowed to, to float into the uh, uh, bloodstream until they can go no further. At the moment, we can wire a rat. We can uh, leave the, uh, the electrodes in the spinal cord. We want to know, if we do so, how long do the wires continue to work properly? We're talking about uh, five years worth of very basic research that needs to be done. So that's one idea that's being floated around, of actually wiring up the brain from the inside. I personally am not too optimistic about that particular technology because the issues of tangling and clotting seem to me just to be so formidable as to pretty much rule this out as a possibility. But there are other possibilities which are actually quite a bit further along. So a year or two ago, I wrote another story in Wired about a technology called optogenetics. It's not a very glamorous sounding name, optogenetics, what's that? What it is, is it's using light to make genetically alter neurons fire or stop firing. So let me explain a little bit further what optogenetics is all about. With a technology like optogenetics, you start by putting altered genes, or rather you start by putting genes inside the neurons in a particular part of the brain. Well, what genes? You take genes from plants. What genes from plants? You take the genes from plants that make them respond to light. So we know that plants do respond to light. A leaf will move toward the sun. Plants are phototropic. You can actually take the gene that makes plants do that and put that gene inside a neuron inside the mammalian cortex. And so when the light is shown on that neuron, it will then actually fire. So you can set it up. The details get very complicated, and I talk about them at length in my book, Worldwide Mind. But you can set up a neuron so that when you shine blue light on it, that neuron will start to fire, and only that neuron. The other neurons around it don't fire. It's possible to make th this technique so specific. You can choose to fire only selected neurons out of a bunch of thousands or millions. Conversely, you can also use yellow light to make neurons stop firing. When you shine a yellow light, the neurons are inhibited. So you can actually turn on and off selected neurons just by shining lights on them. And a way to do this is to put light emitting diodes underneath the skull on top of the brain, where they actually illuminate brain tissue with red and yellow light and other wavelengths as well. So you actually get to control neurons on the cortex of the brain, which is where most cognition takes place, without actually having to cut into the brain or to try to send nanowires into the brain from the other direction through the capillaries. So this is opening up the possibility of creating brain implants that just sit on top of the brain. And let me show you a mouse to whom this has actually been done. So this video, I'll have to show it to you twice for you to really understand what's going on. So you're going to see a mouse sitting in a plastic tank. What you can see is that there is a fiber optic cable that is hanging down 
and going into the mouse's brain. And that cable is being used to send blue light into the mouse's motor cortex, or more accurately, into one half of the mouse's motor cortex. So when blue light illuminates half of the mouse's motor cortex that controls the arms and legs on one side, those arms and legs start to run. Since the other ones are not being stimulated, what happens? The mouse goes in a circle, right? You know, think about it. If you could only move your, your right arm and leg and you were on all fours, you would end up going in a circle. So that's what's going on here. So I'll play it again. And watch very carefully for the blue light that shines in the mouse's head. And as that blue light turns on, the mouse will start to run in a counterclockwise circle. When the light is turned off, the mouse will stop. Okay, watch again. Okay, so the light's not on yet. So in a second, it's going to be turned on. Now, okay, so it's running around because it can't help it. Its brain is being forced to fire the neurons in its motor cortex that make the legs on one side move. And when it stops, it stops and sort of looks up, you know, what the heck just happened? <laughs> so it doesn't look dramatic, this is a mouse running around in a circle. But what's dramatic about it is it's showing that the use of information, light, is being used to precisely control one thing that a mouse does. The mouse is doing one precise thing, it's running around in a circle. It's not having a convulsion, it's not pressing levers, it's not feeling hungry, it's just doing one particular thing. So what this is telling us is that we are beginning to figure out, and I really mean just beginning, beginning to figure out how to decompose activity in the brain to figure out what it means. When this neuron, that neuron, this neuron, and that neuron fire, what does that correspond to? We're just starting to figure out those kinds of relationships. And here's an example of a paper that came out a few years ago, neural encoding of the concept of nest in the mouse brain. So to figure out which neurons activate when the mouse sees its nest. So the ultimate idea is that all the things that we think of as immaterial thought, as our ideas, our perceptions, our feelings, our bodily sensations, our hungers, all of these are ultimately represented and caused by specific patterns of neural activity in the brain. Now, in reality, it is extraordinarily complicated. Researchers have found that when animals like monkeys make what looks like the same motion, different sets of neurons will fire. So it's clearly very complicated. It's not as simple as, oh, neurons X, Y, Z fire, that means that this is happening. The relationships are much more complex than that. And that's partly because the brain is constantly changing and it's constantly learning. So for example, when you train a mouse to move its arm in a certain way and watch neurons fire, if you then put a weight on that monkey's arm so that it has to work a little bit harder to make the same motion, you'll see different neurons fire because the brain is adjusting to learn how to make the arm move the same way even though the situation has changed. So the neural code is not a fixed and solid thing like an alphabet or a language. It is a constantly changing thing. And the challenge is to try to figure out how to understand that well enough to be able to actually intervene in it, to figure out what it means, and to make neurons fired, to make the brain experience a particular sensation, or taste, or hunger, or thought, or feeling. Now, if you think this sounds completely outlandish, consider for a moment that my cochlear implant is sending electrical signals to my brain that makes my brain believe that it's here. I'm completely deaf, I have no biological hearing, and yet researchers have figured out the auditory code of the brain well enough to enable me to hear something that sounds pretty much like normal English. So to give you a bit of the details on optogenetics, so as I said before, it can fire or inhibit just one type of neuron, say motor neurons, that control the arm, while leaving all the others unaffected, and because you're injecting viruses into the tissue to insert the gene into those neurons, you can very much limit where it happens just by only injecting the viruses that carry those genes into particular areas. And so 
With refinements, which I talked about in Worldwide Mind, it's potentially possible to activate only specific neurons and to detect only and to detect, to, to detect which neurons fire when a given action or a given perception or a given thought happens. So optogenetics has really transformed neuroscience. It's allowed researchers to really begin dissecting the actual neural basis of thought and action. So here's a paper that came out just recently and got quite a lot of press. You may have heard about it. Um, in fact, I haven't given you a reference because you can just find it by Googling phrase like brain-to-brain -brain interface real-time sharing. The paper will come up. It's an open access paper. And this was in the lab of Miguel Nicolales at Duke University. And he reported that he had gotten one rat to be able to send a mental signal to another rat to tell that rat which lever to press, the right one or the left one. Okay. So let's dig into that a little bit. When I first heard about the study, here's what I thought they were doing. So they have two rats, and they both have arrays of electrodes implanted in their brains. And those electrodes can both detect neural activity and trigger neural activity. It goes e either way. So what I thought they were doing is they were having the sender rat pressing a left or right bar, okay, depending on which light flashed above it, and that the computer picked up a certain pattern of neural activity that they had previously learned corresponded to pressing, say, the left bar. And that they sent a simple code, you know, it's like a, a certain sensation, to another mouse with an implanted electrode array. And that mouse had learned, when I had this sensation, I pressed the left bar. When I had that sensation, I pressed the right bar. That's what I thought it was. So I was like, oh, that's not such a big deal, because you just do that just by implanting electrodes and training a mouse to do something when it has a certain sensation. Big deal, somewhat. Well, I read the paper very carefully a couple of times, and this is what's really happening. So the sender mouse, which is the one on the left, presses the left or the right bar, let's say it's the left bar. The pattern of neural activity that corresponds to that is picked up and recorded, and it's processed to, to basically clean it up a little bit. And then that actual data, the cleaned up version of that data, is sent to the receiver's brain. So whatever neural pattern fires, whatever they detect in the sender, they clean it up a little bit and they send it to the receiver's brain. So the receiver mouse is getting a slightly filtered version of what's actually going on in the sender rat's brain. And if that mouse actually presses the left bar, the sender mouse gets a reward. The sender mouse gets a drink of water. So that when the sender mouse gets it right, it gets rewarded for that, that activity. So it learns, if I press the bar this way, if I just do it in this certain way, I get rewards. So, there is actually a kind of circular communication going on here between the mice. Now let's start asking some questions. Um, the success rate of this was between 60 and 72 percent, which is not actually incredibly good when you think about that by chance alone you would get a 50 percent success rate. Okay, So clearly there were lots of times when the sender pushed the left bar and the receiver either did nothing or pressed the other bar. So it's clearly not foolproof yet. You can kind of see this pattern of bringing up, uh, it's both amazing and underwhelming, right? This idea comes up over and over again. But it raises some very interesting questions. So do the rats think they're communicating? Or do they just think that stuff is happening in their heads and they're pressing bars? And the paper really doesn't answer that question as far as I can tell. Can the rats see each other? Do they actually know that they are communicating? I'm not clear on that. The other question I think is actually more interesting is that the receiver rat feel that it's responding to a signal. Is it thinking, oh, I'm getting this kind of sensation, I'm going to press the left bar? Or is it actually being forced to press the left bar because the neurons in its brain that fire when the left bar gets pressed is actually, are actually firing? So is the mouse just pushing that bar because it thinks just as if it had decided to do it itself? So that's a very interesting question. We may not know the answer to that until we 
I have to get stop working with rats and start working with people. Because you can't interview a rat and say, well, what do you think happened? But it raises all these very interesting questions. So in the paper, um, I'm just going to quote you what it said at the very end of the paper, which is kind of both mind-blowing and suspiciously vague. Okay, So he says, in theory, channel accuracy, and this is the accuracy of how well it works, can be increased if instead of dyad, a pair, a whole grid of multiple reciprocal, reciprocally interconnected brains are employed. So he's talking about wiring together a whole bunch of rats. All right. Well, what do you get from that? Such a computing structure could define the first example of an organic computer capable of solving heuristic problems that would be deemed non-computable by a general Turing machine. Well, this will mean more if you're a computer geek. Okay. Um, but what they're saying in plain English is that, A, if we connect a whole bunch of rats together, we think something inter interesting is going to happen, but we're not sure what. And they're suggesting that maybe this interconnected set of rats will be able to do things that rats have never been able to do before, whatever that is. So let's start thinking about, well, could you do this to people? And I hope you'll agree with me now that the answer is, in theory, yes. Okay, in theory. There's obviously a lot of technical challenges to solve, but in theory, yes. So let's say you had an implanted optogenetic array in the left person's brain, and that person thinks of an apple, a certain set of neurons fire. So that person's implanted array picks up that set of firings and decodes it. Oh, this means a person is thinking of an apple. And then sends a code over the internet which just consists of the word apple, okay, nothing very complicated, just the word apple. And the receiver's array picks that up, and it knows which neurons to activate in that person's brain to make them have the perception of seeing an apple. So you've sent a perception of seeing something through the internet. These would be literally two brains connected by this kind of internet system. And in worldwide minds, I call this tele-empathy to talk about the fact that this is nonverbal information that's being sent. And that would be the interesting thing. Sending speech, well, we've got a technology to do that. It's called a cell phone. What's more interesting is sending things that we cannot now send over the wires, feelings, perceptions, sensations, ideas, eventually. So let me just issue a whole bunch of little di disclaimers as I wind down. We are still struggling to understand the neural code. It is still essentially impossible to just look at a brain and its neural firing and figure out what that brain is doing. All we can really do now is record a brain's activity as it does something where we know what it's doing, pressing a lever, seeing an apple, and then if we see the brain doing that again, we figure, oh, the brain must be seeing an apple or pressing a lever. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. But there's no way as yet of understanding the general code of the brain. If this electrode, I mean, I'm telling you, if this neuron, that neuron, that neuron, that neuron, these neurons fire, oh, that means the person is thinking of the Wizard of Oz. We're not there yet, okay? And I think that actually getting there is, is, is stupendously difficult. Um, it's kind of like Robert Goddard launching his first rocket that went up 30 feet and then extrapolating from that to say, oh, we'll be able to get to the moon. Well, we could. It's just that we're still at that Robert Goddard stage. I also argue in Worldwide Mind that this technology would not work unless you had a shared communicator context. So unless person A and person B are in a context where thinking about an apple makes sense, just sending these signals is just going to seem like nonsense. So they're going to need a way of, of actually having a context in which these signals make sense. And finally, you need safe, easy, and cheap brain surgery, which is going to be something of a difficult thing to get past the FDA. Okay. <laughs> Still, to wrap up, and we have a couple minutes for questions, um, I just want to point out that cochlear implants were a crazy idea in 1975. Otolaryngologists at that time were saying, it's impossible. You couldn't fit that much computational power inside the brain. You couldn't figure out the auditory code of the ear. You couldn't surgically implant it. Forget it, that's nonsense. And yet it did and didn't happen. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for, for coming and for listening.
So we have about six minutes for questions. Okay. So I invite you to raise a question. If I can't hear you, I may just try it over, or you know, maybe you could just tell me the question you hear better than I can. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I've heard parts of that, but I'll need some help. Mm -hmm. if, if the brain is, is there any research done to rewire the brain? Okay, so it's, it's great. So the question is, is there any research going on to actually use a technology to help people with brain disorders like multiple sclerosis? I don't know about MS, but for Parkinson's, yes. So there is actually quite a bit of research going on, especially at Stanford, to look at what the brain stops doing with patients that have Parkinson's. And so there is active talk of creating optogenetic technologies to implant in Parkinson's patients to stimulate the neurons that are not firing or are firing because the patient has Parkinson's to replicate that person's ability to control their body. So yes, the optogenetics is very much being thought of as a possible treatment for those kind of problems. And in fact, I wrote a story about this in Wired. So if you go to, um, if you do Google search, well, it's actually powered by photons. So if you Google search just powered by photons, you'll come to the story I wrote in Wired, where the principal investigator started with that as his main motivation. He wanted to figure out how to cure Parkinson's. And he started doing research on mice that actually had Parkinson's disease. They were genetically engineered to have Parkinson's. And they found that there were ways to actually make them walk again. So yes, this is very much an active area of research right now. Okay, question. Yes, sir. Okay, this is a very complex issue, and I'm glad you raised that question. I actually talk about it at length in both of my books. So I also spent a year at Gallaudet University, so where I was learning a little bit of sign language. I don't know enough to really have a conversation, because I never learned sign while growing up. But I've certainly thought about this question in a great deal of depth. So it's, it's very, there's very much a split in the deaf community between people who are native sign users and people who've been brought up oral, who grow up using English, like me. So just to give the audience some background, people who are native sign language users, who are immersed in that community, are concerned that the use of cochlear implants will undercut that community. Because if a child gets a cochlear implant, they often can hear well enough to grow up speaking English or another spoken language instead of going to a signing deaf school and learning sign language. So that's the concern. So I know I'm not answering your question yet, but let me ask you, would you like to, to follow up? Okay, 
challenging question. Of course I don't hate deaf people. Okay, that, that's the simple answer to your question. I went and spent a year at Gallaudet University. I'm deaf myself. Here's what I think is going on. 96% of deaf children are born to parents who have normal hearing. Those parents don't know sign language. They have no exposure to sign language. 96%. So when the doctor says to those parents, I have a technology that will enable your child to hear and to grow up speaking your language, what do you think those parents will do? In almost every instance, they will take the cochlear implant. So if there's no conspiracy here, no, nobody hates deaf people. It's just that 96% of deaf children are born to parents who don't know anything about deafness. And those parents, very understandably, I would say, they want to raise a child in their own language, in their own culture. So that's what's going on. So I'll take one more question. Yes, sir. Has there been any thought to using um, this kind of technology, these kinds of technologies, to transmit uh, non-native sensory input into humans? So take all kinds of data that's on the internet, for example, and trans transmitting that into the mind? OK, so the question is, is there any research into, into you used the word non-native, into take me say non-standard kind of information, things that we don't normally hear or feel or see. It's a fascinating question. I think that's that's an idea that many people have. Um, at this point it's a it's it's um, I wouldn't quite say it's a fantasy, but it's a hope. I think this is the kind of thing that Miguel Nicolales was talking about at the end of his article when he talked about linking groups of brains together. Kind of to see what happened, to see what is possible. So in my book, Worldwide Mind, I suggested that this kind of technology could be used to facilitate group communication in a way that's imagistic. So for example, if you have a group of people in a dangerous situation and one of them gets hurt, you may be able to transmit a simulacrum of that sensation of pain immediately to everyone else in the group so that everybody instantly knows, oh, John's just been, just been injured, and to immediately react to that rather than to have to shout and try to explain and so forth. So I think the most exciting use of these technologies is not to do better things that we do today, but rather to enable us to do entirely new things that we can't even imagine now. And this is what the internet has been all about. So when email came out in the 1990s, most people thought, oh, this is just a better way to write memos. But of course, as we all know, it completely changed corporate and personal and social communication in a way that could not have been imagined. And I would expect a similar thing to go on if this technology ever becomes safe and useful. Okay, we have to wrap up. So I've got books out there. I'd be delighted to sign any books you would be delighted to buy. And thank you all so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.